Well, this morning is going to be a message on heaven, part two. We left off last time in our last message in Exodus talking about how Canaan, in many ways, is a preview of heaven. There's these statements there in Exodus 23 of a land offered without sickness and with no enemies. And we talked about how that wasn't fulfilled then, but it will be, those promises will be fulfilled in the future. Perfect health and peace are not guaranteed in this life, but they are to believers in the next life. Those promises will be fulfilled. And our our next text that we're going to look at, Exodus 24, is a vision of what looks like heaven in the very presence of God. And and we'll get to this in the next message. Most of the rest of of Exodus actually is about the tabernacle that's modeled after a, a vision that Moses sees in heaven that is the pattern that it's modeled after. And I ran out of time for that in the last message, so this is going to be part Two on heaven, and I, I really feel pastorally and sense that it's good for us to take time to see and to set our, high, our mind more on things above and not the things of this earth. I know I don't do that enough, and we need this. And so I, I would ask you to turn to Revelation 21, which was read earlier, and, and this is a, a passage that can help wean us from this world to the world to come. And so we'll deep dive into Exodus 24 and the following chapters in in future weeks, but I want to, I want to look up first, take a step back and look up at the the big picture that it points to. And I want to continue what I didn't finish last time, how the New Testament develops this theme. We could look at other passages. Isaiah has a lot to say about the future perfect land that's better even than the promised land that they had in Old Testament times, but Revelation 21 is where I want to start in part two of heaven that really those Old Testament scriptures are part one of and a preview of. So look with me at Revelation 21 verse one again. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And when you hear that word new, think renewed and improved, better than the first. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Derek Thomas preached a sermon on all those no mores. No mores. And he was, he was going through all the, the no mores and someone's cell phone rang. And not missing a beat, he said, and no more cell phones in heaven. But this is a day that is coming where there will be so many no mores. Some of you are in pain today, right now. We've all known days of tears, crying, mourning, and death But there is a day coming when God is going to wipe all of that away and it will be no more. Verse 5 says, God on his throne is going to make all things new. It's all going to be renewed. Peter talked about the restoration of all things. And God also in this life transforms us by renewing our minds. And I think this passage in particular is intended to renew how we think about the renewed world. When I was a young person, I, I didn't think much about or much of heaven at all until a young person I knew passed away. It was a boy named Jason, was the first my age who I knew who went into eternity suddenly. And even at the stage of life I'm at now because of 
being a pastor, I've done many funerals for older ones, but I'll tell you, it, it hits differently when a, when a guy my age dies, like Ty did. Last year, May 12th, a pastor friend that I often met with went to heaven. Paul, May 11, as you know, a young wife, mom, daughter, sister of family here went suddenly. Grace. May 20 is the birthday of our son, my wife and I's son, who died when he was three months old, 13 years ago, baby Mark. Last July, Faith Alterton's sister, a, a mom also of little ones, passed into God's presence. Last month, our founding pastor, Dale, went to glory. He often talked about these things that we're going to talk about today. He studied heaven. In fact, I know he was studying it the last time I was going to ask him to preach, and then he had a stroke and wasn't able to, to speak some of the things he was studying, but he, he gets to see the things that he was studying. This month, Jesse and Shalise Francis, in the days ahead, are expecting baby Zion to come and to go to Jesus. And so as family and friends grieve, and as you miss departed loved ones, we need to look up to heaven's love today. Because thinking of the world above is what can keep us going. In this one, we need to see what John sees in Revelation. After his friends and his family had passed away, he had cared for Mary in his home till the day of her death. He had seen all the other disciples die at the time that he is writing this, some of them horribly. And near the end of the first century, in the end of his life, God gives to him and to all God's people after him this comforting vision of the next life. If, as Paul says, we shall always be with the Lord, we need to comfort one another. We need to know how to comfort one another with these words. Some of you feel alone and, and are alone because you, you live alone. A loved one has died. Revelation was for someone physically alone, literally on the island of Patmos. And John sees where his loved ones are. He sees what it's like. And he sees his loving Lord in heaven. He needed and we need this hope of glory. And so I want us to consider together three questions. First question is this, what will heaven be like in time and space? Where does scripture give hope for dying infants in heaven? And how should heaven give us hope and help today? I was actually studying these things this week and then both those first two questions I was actually asked unsolicited by people not knowing what I was studying and gonna preach on these questions. These are real world questions that all, not all Christians are sure on or even agree on some of the details about the future. I, I think of good songs and good believers who will sometimes speak of heaven as outside of time and space or they'll, they'll say it's, it's, it's more of a state than a place or, or maybe when you were young you imagined it on clouds and disembodied spirits and we've got harps and it's, it's like a never-ending church service. And that may not sound exciting to you, especially when you were young and church was, was boring, but that's, that's what I just described here is not what it's described as in Scripture. Revelation 21 is, is very down to earth, literally. It's heaven on a new earth, enjoyed by new eternal bodies. Real, resurrected, physical flesh, just like Jesus. Remember our Easter message in, in Revelation 20 is talks about the resurrection and the judgment and the rewards. When Jesus was resurrected on, on that first day, and he's the pattern for us, he said a, a spirit doesn't have flesh and bone as you see that I have. And he was able to eat and drink. 
We'll have eyes, verse four says here, but not tears. So there's some differences. We'll have eyes, but not tears. And we'll have bodies without pain and without the possibility of death. So don't think of some boring experience in a building when you were a kid. Think of the most beautiful things of this world because that's the kind of language that it describes it as. What will it be like in time and space? Go to chapter 22, verse 1. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. Or the other translations have serve him. This covers a lot more than singing. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and night will be no more. They will need no light or of lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. And then verse 14, blessed Happy is what that means. Supremely are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. That's a real time and space place. As real as the Garden of Eden, that's what it sounds like and is drawing from. It's restored and it's renewed. Adam and Eve were not allegories. We shouldn't allegorize the beginning of the Bible or the end of the Bible, even though we recognize there can be symbolism, but it it represents a reality. They, They really walked and talked with the Lord in the beginning in the garden, in the cool of the day, and the redeemed will again. There will be fellowship face to face, rivers of delight, and it'll be bright, water and fruit, Better than any in this world, that this world is just a a foretaste of, will serve and work the garden. Like Genesis 2, with but no sin to reign. Saints are going to reign, it says. And it it sounds like as you read it, a a garden city or, or a city with this huge park in the middle. And past hurts are healed there. There's no hospital there for healing. It sounds like the literal best of both worlds. The best of the first, but better in many ways. There will be no nakedness. There will be no night or darkness. We'll wear robes, and there will always be the light of the Lord, it says. And there's another difference. There's no forbidden tree in the middle. Remember in that original perfect world before sin, there was a tree of the knowledge of the good and evil that was forbidden that could bring sin in there. There's no tree like that. There's no possibility of that in the future. There's going to be no more trouble in paradise. God is in the middle now of this final paradise. His throne is the main attraction down Main Street And most of all, the curse is gone. Everything that's related to the curse in this world is gone. There's nothing relating to the curse. And the sinless pleasures of earth and Eden are there, but they are better. So so don't think in glory that it's less real and all spiritual. Think it's it's more real in glorified physical bodies. Here's how C.S. Lewis in the end of the Chronicles of Narnia describes it. It was a deeper country. Every rock and flower and blade of grass looked as if it meant more. I can't describe it any better than that. If ever you get there, you will know what I mean. One summed up what everyone was feeling. I have come home at last. This is home. This is my real country. This is what I have been longing for all my life and looking for. I belong here. 
And another says, the further up and further in you go, the bigger everything gets. The garden was, was really a whole world with its own rivers and woods. It was still Narnia, but it's more real and more beautiful. And then it says, Lucy forgot everything else because Aslan himself was coming. And he told them they were in the shadow lands and now the dream is ended. This is the morning. Imagine that. It's like this life is a dream, but this is now we're waking up and this is the, the real morning. As he spoke, things that began to happen after that, after that were so great and beautiful that I cannot write them. But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in the world and all their adventures had only been the cover and the title page. Now at last, they were beginning chapter one of that great story that no one on earth has read that goes on forever in which every chapter is better than the one before, close quote. This is what's coming in time and space after the second coming of Jesus in the end. Jesus fulfills what human stories long for, but this is no fantasy novel. This is no fairy tale. This is the reality of the prince who beat the dragon in chapter 20 and then is going to take his bride to his castle city in chapter 21. This is the glorious true story where it will actually be eternally, happily ever after and there's something about the heart of man that even longs for this and writes of this but this is the reality in the book the hobbit there's a repentant thorin who says to bilbo before he dies i go now to the halls of waiting to sit beside my fathers until the world is renewed i think he got that from language that the lord used in matthew 19:28 where he says there's going to be a renewal of all things or the new world is how the ESV says it. But before that, we wait with our forefathers of the faith. In Revelation 6, souls that die are beside others waiting and they're asking, how long, how long is it going to be till everything is made right? They're waiting for their renewed, resurrected bodies in heaven now, before that new heaven and earth. Some call that the intermediate, intermediate state before the eternal state. Or just to use the words of Jesus on the cross. Remember Pastor Corey preached this a couple of weeks ago. He says to the one, today you will be with me, where? In paradise. In paradise. Revelation 2, 7 promises. In, before the end also, he says, to all who overcome, I will grant to eat of the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. So that tree of life is there in the paradise of God. And that's a reality today in glory. The very day that person died on the cross, he went there. It's a reality also for the glorified bodies in the end of Revelation. That paradise, that tree of life, though, is a reality now. Paul talked about being caught up to paradise. And he says absent from the body is what? Present with the Lord. So when a believer's body goes into the grave, his soul goes to Jesus, to his presence that day. We don't believe in soul sleep. There's a day, though, when Jesus will leave heaven to return, and resurrected bodies and souls will reunite as literally as the body of Jesus was resurrected, the bodies of believers will be as well and will meet him in the air. In Revelation 19, Jesus comes down to earth, and in Revelation 21, his paradise garden city comes down too. He's going to renew the earth. He's going to remove the curse, and it sounds to me like it's actually heaven on earth. His kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. That prayer will be fully and finally answered one day, but before that day comes, you must Trust him as your king if you're going to be a part of that kingdom. You must repent of your sin because hell is a real place too. And it was read in the scripture earlier. All the, all the faithless and all those who, who live lives of unrepentant sin will be a part of the lake of fire, not this glorious reality. 
boy, if we could just see a, a glimpse of heaven or a glimpse of hell, what a, a difference that should make for us. But we do have that glimpse in the scripture. And we do know it, it is clear that time is short. You need to trust the Lord in this life if you will see him in the next. He needs to be your Lord and Savior. You need to turn from your sins and trust him because time is short. Revelation 22 says from heaven, I think five times, something like the time is soon or the time is near. Something heaven has no time or is timeless. But as I was digging into this this week, as I look at Revelation 22 verse 2, it talks about months. There's apparently 12 kinds of fruit that change over the months it will always be in season. And this verse also in Isaiah 66, 22 to 23 says, the new heavens and the new earth which I make will endure before me from new moon to new moon and from Sabbath to Sabbath, another translation, from week to week and month to month. And then Isaiah 65, talking about the future heaven and earth, says there's still years and days. In fact, it's repeated four times in just a few verses. But stay here in Revelation. Go to chapter 8. Because as we think of the final eternal state or the, the state before then, we might wonder what that's like. Revelation 8 verse 1 says this, When the Lamb, that's Jesus, opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And then chapter 9 verse 15 talks about heaven waiting for an exact hour, day, month, and year. In, in chapter 11, there's loud voices in, in heaven, elders, they're using the word time to, to celebrate the time of reward. In chapter 12, commands heaven to rejoice because the time is short. Jesus said those in heaven rejoice every time one sinner repents. Luke, verse, Luke chapter 15, it seems, and, and I don't fully understand this, in some way that saints are aware of what's happening down here in real time. If you look at Revelation 6, verse 9, it gives a, a, a hint of that. Revelation 6, verse 9, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness that they had borne. So this is heaven now in a time before resurrection bodies. And he sees them as souls. It seems like there's some visible form, but they don't have their physical form yet. Verse 10, they cried out with a loud voice, O oh, sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long? They're asking how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. Then they were given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete. So, so there's, as I read this, a, a real place of real time and space for souls and glory now and bodies in the end, but there's no curse. And there's things about time that maybe are associated with the curse in this age. Maybe we could say there will be a new quality of time, like, like Eden I think when we think about how it was in the beginning, it can be more, but I don't think it'll be less. Think of days without end. Isaiah 65, behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. There will no longer be heard the voice of weeping and the sound of crying. Listen to this. No longer will there be in it an infant who lives but a few Days And the prophets give these hints and hope that infants we wept for will live again, which takes me to question number two. Where does Scripture give hope for dying infants in heaven? Isaiah's new heaven and earth text ends with, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, that's chapter 65. And then Isaiah 11 has the exact same word for word, but here's the verse right before it. Maybe you've heard this before, haven't thought about it. The infant, the infant will play near the, core, the hole of the cobra, and the young child will put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy Mountain. That's, and that exact phrase is used in the new heaven and new earth passage in chapter 
65. Isaiah pictures infants and little children, and they're going to be safe. There. And this is after verse 4, when the Lord strikes the earth with a rod and slays the wicked with a word. That's second coming language in Scripture. The wicked are slain. But in Isaiah, the infants are safe. And the young ones in this kingdom. And there's debate. You can read about whether this is talking about Revelation 21 to 22 or, or chapter 20 or, or both. But either way, this is after the resurrection. And it, as you get into some of that, it raises more questions than I can answer, but it raises expectations of little ones being raised. Isaiah 11:6 talks about wolf and lamb and lion lying down together. And it adds this, a little child will lead them. Listen to Isaiah 40. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. And this is part of the comfort. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs. Those are the little ones that, he, that he's shepherding. He gathers the lambs in his arms. He carries them close to his heart. Or another translation, in the fold of the garment. Those that are nursing. He cares for in a special way. He carries them. That same word carries is used in the womb in Isaiah 46, verses 3 through 5. I will carry, he says, and I will save. A shepherd doesn't leave behind. I think we've got another verse if we can help advance it. But a shepherd doesn't leave behind the dying lamb. Will he not gather? Will he not carry and save, Isaiah says? God has a a special place in his heart for little ones in his arms. And even if their little heart stops, but we need to understand also, even little sinners need to be saved. And we can look to our big God and his character and his nature to save. But there's a, there's a key verse in Isaiah, or in Jonah actually, Jonah 4.11, where God explains he didn't judge Nineveh in part as mercy on their little ones. He says this, shouldn't he have compassion on this city where there's 120,000, he says, this is a massive city, and there's this great number who do not know their right hand from their left. He's talking about those so young, they don't even know how to tell their hands apart yet. He had sovereign grace upon them. Sovereign grace, I think, is the key that withheld wrath for ignorant innocence, even in that pagan country and with pagan families, with unsaved parents. It wasn't that their parents were saved. The prophet Jeremiah quotes God calling child sacrifice the, the blood of the innocents, the blood of the innocents, Jeremiah 19 four through five. It's not that they're sinless. It's that scripture speaks of them and God does in this special category for pity to be spared. God actually calls those who are being sacrificed to pagan gods. He calls them my children. That's, that's not a phrase that God uses of, of pagans in scripture, but he uses it of those sacrificed to pagan gods as little children. Biblical language for those God saves and makes his family by adopting grace. Even those were their idol-worshiping dads, killed babies for false gods. The true God says, they're my children. He has a special claim upon them. Ezekiel also, 18.20, says, kids do not face judgment for their parents' sin. The soul perishes for its own personal sin, Ezekiel 18, verse 20. And on the flip side, no one is saved by having a believing parent or by baptism or baby christening or anything like that. I don't see in Scripture an, an age of accountability. I, I do see in Scripture we're, we're sinners even in the womb. David wrote about that in Psalm 58, Psalm 51. Even in the womb, we have that sin Nature, But David, who knew that, also wrote in the Psalms about God's special care in the womb for little ones. Psalm 22, verse 10 would be an example. Psalm 139. But think about David's own 
life. He had a baby boy who died when he was seven days old. And 2 Samuel 12 tells us this, that David said, when he had found out his little boy had passed away, this was a great comfort to, to me many years ago, when I had found out my baby boy passed away, here's the hope that David has, I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. And then it says, David comforted his wife. He heard his infant died. David rose. He went to the house of the Lord. He worshiped, probably worshiped like Job did, saying the Lord is given, the Lord is taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But his comfort was in knowing that he would go to be with his son again. Even though his son couldn't come back, he was going to go to him. And this is recorded. Scripture says all those things written in former times are written for our hope. In inspired scripture, this is recorded by a man who, who knew and wrote about resurrection. I think David wrote as much or more than anyone in the Bible on heaven and hell and the afterlife. But contrast his reaction there when after his grown, wicked son, Absalom, died. Do you remember that story? When Absalom died in, in rebellion, David was inconsolable. He just wept, Absalom, Absalom, my son, my son, my son. And he refused to be comforted. He, he took no comfort in that. But here, with his infant son who dies, it's a very different picture where he has this comfort, he comforts his wife. And the comfort, you can't just explain, well, he's just saying, I'm, I'm just gonna go to the grave too. And, and that gave him comfort, I'm going to the grave too. No, this isn't about going to the grave. This is about hope beyond the grave for a dying babe that he would go and see him in the place where believers go when they die as well. Ecclesiastes 6, three through five talks about a, a man not satisfied with God, a sinful man. And it says, a stillborn child is better than he and finds rest rather than he, rather than that type of man who had all these things in this life but wasn't satisfied and God was sinful. A stillborn child is better and finds rest unlike that man. Job chapter 3, Job says this, why did I not perish at birth and die as I came from the womb? And this is part of what Job says, I would be lying down in peace and at rest, like an infant who never saw the light of day, there the wicked cease. So he's talking about a place where the wicked cease and the weary are at rest. Captives also enjoy their ease. The small and the great are there and the slave is freed from his master. Solomon and Job both speak of dying infants going to a better place than the wicked enjoying rest, ease, peace, free. And this is the same Job who, who knew that his Redeemer lived. He knew that in the end there would be a resurrection, that he would stand on the earth. His own eyes would see him on this earth. That same Job said, in the place where the wicked cease, great men and small ones will rest in peace. Those are some Old Testament hopes. What about the New Testament? I think Romans helps see how sinful little ones can be saved because you got to think through the argument of Romans and the gospel. Romans 1 says, there is wrath of God that is revealed on men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They know it, but they willfully suppress it and they rebel against it. And then it lists out sins that Infants and toddlers don't commit, and it goes through all these different things about how they respond to conscience and creation and the revelation that they have as to why they are without excuse. And Romans 2 says judgment falls on those who are judgmental, stubbornly, unrepentant, rejectors of the kindness and the goodness that should have led them to repentance. But Romans 3 is very clear. There's none who are righteous. No, not one. 
And we're not to say, but, but, but my child is, is righteous. No, none are righteous, and all of them are accountable. So, and it doesn't give an age. And we all sin. We have that sin within us and our sin nature, but we don't become sinners at a certain age or when we sin. We sin because we are sinners in our core and in our heart. We all sin, but Romans 3 says we can be justified as a gift by grace through Christ's redemptive work. Romans 5 says, and it actually explains why those who even sin passed to all because, because of Adam's sin, and, and you think about that, if there wasn't sin in the world, no one would die, and there's children that die even before they're born as a result of that curse and of, of Adam's sin. It's one of the terrible things of this cursed world but the argument that Paul makes is not that babies are godly at all, but that they're, they're, they are presented in Scripture as helpless. And here's what Paul says in Romans 5, 8. Here's how salvation happens. While we were still helpless, Christ died for the ungodly. He dies, another version says, for those who are still powerless. He can and does save those with no ability to do anything for their salvation. Romans eleven six talks about being chosen by grace. Grace, sovereign grace, I think is the key. Now, if it is by grace, Paul says, then it is not by works. Otherwise, grace ceases to be grace. New King James calls that the election of grace. Grace, by definition, is undeserved and freely given, not by what we do. Sovereign grace is how anybody in this room got saved. God gives life to those who are incapable without it. That's how salvation works. By grace alone, God unilaterally regenerated us who were spiritually lifeless and helpless and powerless. And this was a question that came up. This is centuries ago, especially in the 1600s. Many died in infancy. And so they had to address this as they would put statements of faith together and the Reform confessions were all united in this language. Elect infants, speaking of infants as elect, dying in infancy. So it's clarifying those who would die in infancy, not just in general. It's not that they're, they're all saved when they're little and then they become unsaved. No, it's if they die in infancy, their elect are regenerated and saved by Christ through the Spirit. So no one gets to the Father but through the Son. The Spirit must be involved. So also are other elect persons who are incapable of being outwardly called by the ministry of the Word. And I think they're speaking here of those with severe mental incapabilities that would be like little children, even though they might be many years on this earth. So whether the 1600s or even in England or 1742, Baptist Confession here in Philadelphia used that language. And, and the language 200 plus years after that, Charles Spurgeon wrote that he knew of, of no one, no, no Reformed Christian anywhere who doubted that all infant death is under grace. That all, he, he understood it from all that he'd, he'd read as well as anyone, that they believe that God in his grace chooses to elect and be gracious to all infants who die in infancy. Not about whether their parents are believers or not. And I think it's right also for those mentally like infants and right to see all dying infants at, as elect. I read those very words of that section in the confession years ago for a memorial here for Victoria Conti. Some of you remember that. Uh, uh, into her teens, her brain never fully developed. And I, I believe those same principles and truths apply to that, but we, we need sound theology. We need sensitivity. It's, it's not about just sentimental wishes. It's about a scriptural word, and I think the reformed truth of sovereign grace is that solid hope, and it's much more hope than Arminian theology where it makes regeneration a, a dependent on a free will choice. And so they try to struggle with how do we explain this if it's all about making a free will choice and not about sovereign grace. 
and they've got to explain other things away in Scripture, but I think sovereign grace is what we need to bank on. Charles Hodge said this, all who die in infancy are doubtless saved, but they are saved by grace. It's not that they didn't need rescuing, it's that they are rescued as we see all these principles in God's character. They would need to be saved by the blood of Jesus applied to them. And there's a, a hint of that in Revelation. So look at Revelation 5, verse 9. It says, and they sang a new song, saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and tongue. Stop there. There are tribes and tongues or languages that have gone out of existence before any adults embraced Christ. But Christ's blood saves from every tribe and language if their dying babies make up part of the redeemed. It, bring, it would bring God praise to know, even from extinct languages, and even those too young to learn language, that they are part of his grace. I expect to see little people there of every people group, including those that perished without the gospel, their people group there. It would be a beautiful fulfillment of Psalm 8, Verse 2, from the mouths of nursing babes, you have ordained praise that you might put an end to the enemy. How majestic will be his name in all the new earth when the last enemy of death is overcome. Jesus said it's from infants that he's prepared praise in a special way. Matthew 21. And then Matthew 19, 14, just two chapters earlier, Jesus said, let the little children come and to me, do not hinder them, for to such, like these little children, belongs the kingdom of heaven. Luke says they brought babies. Mark says Jesus blessed them. He took them in their arms. Jesus wasn't blessing and taking in his arms the, the Pharisees, but he was blessing and taking into his arms these little children and infants. And Jesus was indignant when people wanted to keep toddlers at arm's length. He gathers them into his arm. He, he's the, the shepherd Isaiah talked about who gathers lambs into his arms and holds them near and dear to his heart and blesses them. The one who cares for and is close to and carries gently the nursing babes. The one who comforts those who grieve. Surely he bears our sorrows and our griefs. Isaiah said, and in heaven's kingdom, babes are not forbidden to come. And adults need childlike Faith, I think that's the main point. We need to be like children, but don't miss, being an infant is not a hindrance to our big God and his saving plan. Spurgeon said this, I believe that the Lord Jesus who said, of such is the kingdom of heaven, doth daily and constantly receive into his loving arms those tender ones who die to heaven. I've got more notes in my footnotes. You can read more what other theologians have written. But I want you to know his arms are open to you today if you will come as a child. If you will come lowly and humbly, crying out in faith to him. That grace is available to you. But how should, how should heaven give us hope and help today? First of all, and the most obvious for a loved one now with the Lord, I, I, th I think we need to even think about how we speak sometimes because we, we use the phrase, I, I've done it, lost loved ones. But if they're in Christ, we've only lost contact with them temporarily. They're not lost. We say he or she passed away, and we all know what that means. We've all said it. But in the Lord, it's actually true that they pass into his presence. They're not just passing away, they're passing into his presence. So look with me at Revelation 7, verse 15. Therefore, it says, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. This is, this is heaven now, before the end, and those who are being saved before the end. He who sits on his throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. 
and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe every tear away from their eyes. What a, what a blessing that is. His very presence is going to shelter whatever tears we have in this life. They're going to be wiped away. Isaac Watts said, His own soft hand shall wipe the tears from every weeping eye and pains and groans and griefs and fears and death itself shall die. Amen. There's also hope of the new earth and our new bodies. John Street told me last weekend, he can't believe how much better he feels since he got a new kidney. And he said he's been thinking about, and the last sermon before he was here, he was preaching about when, when all things are made new, when we have our new bodies, he's just saying, if this, is, if this is what it's like just to have one little organ made new, I can only imagine what it'll be like when, when we're made completely new. What a glory that'll be for our final new bodies. Chris Anderson, who I went to school with, has written a number of Songs, one of them says this, creation groans beneath the curse, rebellion's just reward. We long to see the fall reversed and Eden's joys restored. We joy to fix our gaze on Christ, though now our view is dim. We long for heaven's grandest prize to see and be like him. Come quickly, Lord, make all things new. Redeem the church, your bride, with longing eyes. We look for you, for home is at your side. Isn't that great? Home is at his side. And it's fitting as we long for that final new creation, that we live as new creations now. Because this is the same language in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone's in Christ, he is a, what, New creation, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's language that's right there in the last chapter of the Bible. That's going to happen to the world, but it's already happened to us spiritually. And even some of the imagery at the end of the Bible there, like a river of living water flows. Jesus says, whoever believes in me, out of him will flow rivers of living water. And he was talking about the Spirit. And he says, we're always to bear the fruit of the Spirit. And when heaven is for the healing of the nations, the, the scriptures also talk about how we are to speak in ways that bring healing. A couple of verses there from Proverbs 12, 18. There is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. And then Proverbs 15, 4 is, is a direct reference to that imagery when it says a gentle tongue is a tree of life that tree of life is described as a place of healing a gentle or a soothing tongue can be that spiritually in someone's life you can bring healing to someone today this week in the way that you speak that we would long that our our tongues would be like trees of life and bring healing give us gentle words wise words to those who are suffering or struggling or in sin. Second Peter 3, what kind of people ought you to be? He says, in light of the end to come, he says, you ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day. He says, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace. We don't want to be quarreling with our brothers and sisters when our Lord comes. We want to be occupied with being holy because when we see him, we will be like him as he is. And if you want to read more about heaven, I, I've been reading a book. I'm not quite done. It's, it's kind of big, but it's by Randy Alcorn, Heaven. I would, I would highly recommend it to you. Or if you want something smaller to start with, a sermon from the 1700s, Jonathan Edwards, you can just find this online. Heaven is a world of love. That will do you a world of good to just read about. And his, his, his metaphors and his language 
is just incredible. But I want to end with a spoken word poem by an artist by the name of Braille. He's part of the beautiful eulogy team. He says, we live and do ministry in the era of the old heaven and the old earth. All our efforts, efforts and relationships are plagued, constrained, and cursed. Creation is in the bondage of corruption, waiting for reconstruction, affecting everyone and everything and everywhere we go, reminded of the fall. We feel the tug and the pull from the pain in our joints to our fingers that point to whatever disappoints, constant conflict, weak and sick, discouraged and depressed. The fog is so thick, nation is against nation, hurricanes strike and earthquakes rumble, towers tumble. But the old will pass away, sin won't have the last say, God has spoken his rebuttal. These sufferings and trials could never compare to the glory being prepared for all the redeemed whom Christ has made heirs. If you are in Christ, your best life isn't now. The very best moments in this life are a glimpse, but we are homeward bound. This world is not our home. What, what awaits beyond the gates, an oasis? The very best moments in this life are only but a taste. He is making all things new. He will eradicate the sea, eliminate the wicked, and triumph over his enemies and deliver us to our destiny so we can be who we were destined to be, children of God in the presence of our Father. The Lamb will be our shepherd and guide us to springs of living water, never discontent. Every need is met. The blessings never cease. Total joy, total peace. In regards to our future, we need not be frightened. If we are in Christ, we will be right beside him. Oh, how we long to be with the one to whom we belong. When the faith will be sight and the tears will be wiped and the infection of sin will be healed by his stripes as we feel his embrace and gaze face to face with the Lord who is raised and join with the saints and angels singing his praise. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Our God, we long to be with you to whom we belong. We, we long to be free of sin and all of its effects. I pray, Lord, that we would, as new creations in you, be used of you to represent that kingdom to come, and that it would be more in our lives on earth as it is in heaven, even as we long for that ultimate day of the new heaven and the new earth. Help us to live in light of it and for it. We pray these things in the name of our risen and reigning and returning King Jesus. Amen. Thank you.